we began ranting. We ran confused through the world looking for answers. Then we stopped. We sat still and we listened. We asked questions. We discussed. We looked within, found out we were never without, and we stood upright and began a new life, in a new world, with new eyes. And now, we move onward, toward our greatness, knowing that every day we're making ourselves better for the whole. This is our mission. This is our statement. Lifting the veil is no task to be taken lightly. It is indeed the greatest calling of all.
There we were, fresh and ready from all the worldwide protests and actions taken that paves our way to the greatness we feel coming. The energy was incredible and expected and quickening spiraled up and out. Are we truly ready for it all? It comes in heavy, thick and dense. Can we stay afloat? Some of us are still bound. There are still many lessons to be learned progress in our suffering as we watch our situations repeat in case we aren't paying attention. Are we getting the lessons? Are we getting the lessons? Are we breaking our patterns? Have we created a new storyboard resolving issues with the last one? Did we toss the old storyboards or did we just modify them? Watching that not work, modify it again around and around until it finally clicks that we need to wipe them clean. No matter, here it comes and we take our path as we do. We have our choices to make, our baggage to drop, our trails to blaze. The universe seems to repeat the realities of our attachment in our illusionary states to prove that these trends will no longer serve our development. Are you present for it? Do you recognize the signs? Do you feel the surges of energy beckoning us to let go and finally allow our greatness to shine through? A beautiful light grows within every single one of us as we have a chance to truly make ourselves known for who we are. We are vibration, we are energy, we are reflection of each other's higher and lower truth. We are deep, born with our ancestral organic knowledge, wise enough to elevate what we must, grateful enough to sustain what we must. We are curious, free to choose, free to be. The only thing that separates us are our choices. We are one in love, one in truth, changelessly. That's who I believe we are. Government and politics is something that we collectively should have transcended a long time ago. Yet it still exists, and it's still part of the average individual's life. We as individuals have continued to give our power away to people who we think know what is best for us. And we are always relinquishing our own individual responsibility, our own individual divinity to other people who they themselves don't even know what is even good for themselves. And we continue to do this collectively. Most of it is because we are all indoctrinated from birth to uphold this sort of status quo of how things supposedly work on this planet. When you're a child, you're taught from your parents that government and politics is just part of our lives. It just has to be there because these people know what is best for us. Nothing could be further from the truth, especially when you understand what our government really is.
we should be understanding that if these aren't natural systems, we need to transcend them and try to find out a way for the individual and the collective to move forward past these illusionary boundaries of politics and government, because that's all they are. They are illusionary boundaries that continue to suppress the individual, which is the suppression of the society. We can never step into an enlightened society if the individual continues to believe that they need to vote for a certain person, or they need to be part of a certain political party, or they need to uphold their current government. We're never going to move forward. We're going to continue to slip further into the devolution of the species. The planet will move on. The human species will be gone because we continue to uphold unnatural systems. We have to move past them. Now, to articulate this, the great British philosopher Alan Watts once said, when it comes down to it, Government is simply an abandonment of responsibility on the assumption that there are people other than ourselves who really know how to manage things. But the government run ostensibly for the good of the people becomes a self-serving corporation. To keep things under control, it proliferates laws of ever increasing complexity and unintelligibility and hinders productive work by demanding so much accounting on paper that the record of what has been done becomes more important than what has actually been done. About this one might go on and on, but in the current anxiety concerning overpopulation, pollution, ecological imbalance and the potential disasters of nuclear fission, it is only seldom recognised that governed nations have become self-destroying institutions, paralysed and bogged in their own complications and suffocating beneath mountains of paper. We're here on this amazing ball of dirt and water, and it's a miracle. It almost makes me cry just thinking about how beautiful the universe is. It's the most exciting time we could have hoped to be alive. Art, music, culture, ideas all exploding, sharing knowledge on the internet, sharing knowledge about ourselves, learning about ourselves, learning what we need, what we want. What we can do without. I've realized that my relationship with the state is an abusive one. Those who work for the state tell me that they're serving me, but they are no servant. And I am no master, except of my own life. I don't seek to control the lives of others, as some may do to me. I instead rely on voluntary, peaceful, mutually beneficial exchange. So, I like to remember that it's all an illusion. The path to freedom in your life starts with a freedom mindset. I am your king. Didn't know we had a king. Then who is your lord? We don't have a lord. What? I order you to be quiet. Order? Yes. Will you shut up? Oh, now we see the violence inherent in the system. Shut up! I view the state as the cause of many things which I view to be intolerable. I limit my funding of the organization as much as possible, to every extent possible. So that means not paying taxes and 
not participating with their mail system. I'm fortunate enough to be able to do those things. Some people are not. Correction, everybody is free to do those things. Some people choose not. I guess that's really my point. How do we make ourselves more free? Well, you are free. If you want to see things change, you have to have the courage to act on your beliefs. You only get to live once. If you're going to say you believe in something, put your ass on the line. Otherwise, be honest with yourself and say you want a quiet life. But in your quest to make change, don't be fooled. Lines have been drawn for you to follow. Protest here. Vote here. It's all smoke. Wow. It seems like the system is a lot different than we think it is. The saying that change starts with you has mystical implications. I truly believe we are all one in a greater sense. And so if you see hate in the world, add love to your life. If you see greed, show generosity. Treat others with kindness and live free. Now, living free can be dangerous depending on where you live. So if you're planning on living completely free, I recommend you move to New Hampshire. When I say stand up for your beliefs and act on your principles, that could mean civil disobedience and getting arrested and serving jail time. It's a twisted, crazy world where you could serve jail time for a non-crime. If that's not for you, I understand. But in my opinion, though you may be caged by another, making bold choices and taking the consequences is the most exhilarating part of life and what I love about freedom. Unfortunately, in my lifetime, civil disobedience may not be the most productive way to fight the state. There are other ways to enhance freedom in your life that don't involve getting arrested. Being bad feels pretty good. Politicians are liars, so get those out of your life. The best thing that I've been able to do is stop listening to these politicians. It's harmful to hear their lies. My recommendation? To free your clarity of thought. Stop paying any mind to people who claim to be your overlords. This goes just about opposite of everything I've ever learned in my life. Some people scoff at this, but try it. It's easier than you think. I must admit, this information is pretty hard to believe. The state is everywhere, and instead of being negative about it, it can be helpful to keep a positive attitude about the small changes you're making in your life to increase your opportunities to exercise freedom. For example, some of my food comes from local farmers. The FDA had nothing to do with it. While I used to do all of my grocery shopping in those regular chain stores, there's something about their resemblance to a Toys R Us that just doesn't sit with me. And while it's nice to use those self-checkout counters that they have at some stores, there's nothing like having a real-life relationship with your farmer. And in the U.S., it's possible just about everywhere. I live in Philadelphia, a major metropolitan area, and am still able to get local farm fresh food. This is called the information age, and with good reason. You have access to the world's knowledge. Unfortunately, predatory agents of the state have corrupted the mainstream media, and people today are left with very few options for information dissemination. But more solutions are being created every day, as the great equalizer, the internet, is bringing us all closer together. Email? I heard that's really neat. Want to write a letter to President Clinton? Would he answer us? Another important aspect, and one that is so often overlooked, is maintaining one's health. Health is wealth. None of the gold or silver or Bitcoin in the world matters if you don't have your health. That means taking the time and putting in the work to exercise, get fresh air, quit smoking, limit drinking, eat real food. Everything tastes good and you're eating well. See what good eating habits can do for you. Finally, freedom in your personal life means dealing with people that you like. 
The world is filled with wonderful people. There is no reason you should be dealing with a single one who displeases you. When one breaks one's relationship with statists, one opens the possibility for new relationships. Relationships based on mutual understanding, respect, consent, non-aggression. As a person who broke all ties and moved to New Hampshire to commit a victimless crime spree, and as a person who has served jail time for that victimless crime spree, I can tell you that when freedom is outlawed, only outlaws will be free. I'm doing now is to show people how the things that govern and control us are in fact nothing but fictional constructs in our minds. The truth is a corporation doesn't exist. It never has and it never will. However, we all behave and believe as if they do exist. Just ask anybody who made their car or who made their favorite drink. They will spout off some corporate name instead of the actual people who put their hard work, creative energy and resources into making that product. The corporation did nothing. The corporation is nothing but an idea written down on a piece of paper. What makes the corporation real is that there are millions of people who put on masks each day to work for or buy things from the fiction. However, it could not do a damn thing without the people. People infuse energy and power into these fictions. You want the corporation to die? Stop feeding it power and energy. Stop talking as if they exist. Stop doing business with them. It is very simple. The idea of government is no different. There are literally millions of people who put on masks every day and pretend to be something that they're not. They act out and think that it is real and that their acting gives them some sort of power and authority over others. The only reason why it works is that the people believe them and submit to their authority. In the end, this only works because of the mass delusion of those involved. I 
I believe that a significant and very painful disturbance is required to shake people out of this mass psychosis. This disturbance will rock the world down to its foundation. And I believe that this is necessary in order for us to break the bonds of slavery that has consumed our minds, our hearts, and our souls. Once that has happened, the people will be open and willing to start working on a truly free, prosperous, and open way of living with one another. It will require that we govern ourselves rather than forcing our will upon others. It requires respect, honor, empathy, love, and compassion. Not only for ourselves, but for our brothers and sisters, our food, our environment, all the animals that we share the earth with, and all the plants upon which we are so dependent on. It is all about our relationships and how we will recognize that the fiction has a hold on us. My work is about teaching people to recognize the fictional realm and only use it as a tool. When you're done with it, put it down. The truth is that we exist in the physical and spiritual realms. That is where we need to return to in order to be truly free. Tranquility Bay, this is Houston. Can we get both of you on the camera for a minute, please? Roger, we'd like to get both of you on the field of view of the camera for a minute. effective way to really get the truth and it's to look at a picture of planet earth it's really that easy because from up there you see there is no borders it's really just one big blue ball traveling through space and we are all on it it's literally our home so when you look at it this way it becomes obvious that if we dump toxic waste in another part of the world we are still dumping it in our home and when you go to war in another part of the world you are still destroying yourself that's when you start to ask questions like Why do we value pieces of paper more than the earth itself? Why do we fight for its resources? Why are some people living in unnecessary luxury while others are starving to death? When really the earth could provide for everyone. You know, even astronauts that have been to the moon and looked back at earth are saying the same thing. When you look at it from this higher perspective, it's not a matter of fancy debates with uh, political jargon anymore. It's really irrelevant. It's about waking up from this dream and realizing that we're all one, we're all cohabitants of the earth. And if we keep destroying it and fighting each other, well, we're, we're really going to crash. So it's about time we realize that it is in our hands, our destiny as a collective is in our hands. It's not about letting this separate entity we call the government make all the big decisions while we just mind our own business. Isn't it more exciting to know that we are all co-creators here and we can choose to be an active part of this change? You know, all the talent, the skill and the creativity that we're using right now to create this very limited world, we could use to create something completely different. Something that would actually allow us the freedom to evolve.
education literally translates as indoctrination. When you are educated, you are simply being indoctrinated. There is a set curriculum by which they wish to educate you. That curriculum is dictated usually by your government. That's the real problem with education is that you're not actually learning about the world. You're being told how the world is from the perspective of the people who are currently in control of you, namely your government. And that's what education really is to me. A way of ensuring that people cannot be creative, cannot be independent, instead trained to regurgitate things that they hear without any thought entering the equation whatsoever. You are not being trained to think. You are being trained to accept. You are being trained to regurgitate. You are being engineered into a worker who does not question his employer. A student that does not question his teacher. This is why we have a dumbed-down population today. We're so dumb, not in spite of the fact, but because of the fact that we've all been educated. Training. That's what does it. And training starts in the school each day in the good American way. The purpose of the education system in Western democracies and indeed all over the world today is to change children away from their own creativity and sense of wonder and to help them streamline their own consciousness with the bureaucratic system. In other words, to make them bureaucratic robots. This will help streamline their involvement and their participation while engaging with corporate and political structures by having the child learn things that are completely useless to them such as logarithms, algebra, compound fractions and other statistical nonsense. The reason why they learn them is for that function of diminishing the right brain and making the analytical left brain dominant. When you have a brain that's analytically driven, it's more likely to acquiesce to authority figures and control systems and methods. It's less likely to think for itself. It's akin to a charioteer with one wheel larger than the other, trying to steer the chariot as it moves. It's always compensating for the lack of one wheel being smaller. The same thing with a diminished right brain. The child will spend its life trying to compensate for the reduction in cognitive functioning within their right brain. So they give over their consciousness to control figures and to authority figures and systems. While the child is learning about statistical ideas, such as logarithms and algebra, subjects such as poetry and art are played down. When we learn about poetry in school, the child is never ever really given the understanding of the underlying metaphors within the words of the poems. They'll know more about the poet's history, his life story, and great detail will be given to the structure of the poem, but very little will be given to the actual underlying meaning of the syntax. If this was done, it would only make the right brain more effective. So therefore the arts are structured and presented in such a way that they're analytical and they're more likely to be seen 
as left brain concepts even though they should be right brain. Again, this helps the child understand that they cannot function without authority figures. And the first one they learn about is the school teacher and this goes on for the rest of their lives. I don't believe that political action is, is going to do it for us. I think that political action has been tried for about, even if we get rid of the ancient Rome and ancient Greece examples, three or four hundred years, people have been trying to use politics to restrain and control the state. It never works. The state just gets bigger and bigger, faster and faster. I mean, if we couldn't control the state in 1800 when it was about one twentieth the size it is now, we sure as hell aren't going to control and contain it now, right? So I don't think political action is going to do it. I think what's going to do it, and this is not just an opinion, there's some pretty good science behind it. What is going to do it is uh, raising children without aggression, right? Raising children without violence, without spanking, without hitting, without threats, without yelling, without abuse, without all oh, this kind of stuff, right? And it's this pretty terrible situation at the moment. I mean, why do we have a violent society? Why do we have a society where people accept coercion as a rational way of getting people to do stuff because that's how it works in the home. Over 90% of parents still hit their children to get them to do what they want. So of course those kids grow up and say, well, yeah, someone threatens me with violence to get me to do the right thing. That makes perfect sense because that's how I grew up for the first 15, 18, 20 years of my life, right? I mean, that's the language you speak. It's like speaking English, right? You, you grow up and you, you don't even think of it as speaking English in a way. That's just language, right? And so if you raise children with aggression, and this is parents, uh, majority of parents, this is uh, priests with their threats of hell and sin and, and bonfires forever, and, uh, and it's public school teachers who punish, it's your peers who threaten with humiliation and so on. We're just so steeped in this way of doing things that says, do what I say, or I'm going to do really nasty stuff to you in one way or another, or spank you or threaten you with hellfire or humiliate you in, in school or whatever. And so when the kids come out into adulthood and they're like, the, 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 the teacher gets replaced with the policeman uh, or the priest gets replaced with the politician, you know, do this or you're bad and, and, and do this or you go, in, you go to jail or do this or whatever, right? But it's like, look, that's perfectly natural to them because that's how they're raised. But if you raise children without that hierarchical aggression, without punishment, without threats, I mean, they'll grow up and it'll be like, the, the state will start threatening them, but you're like, what the hell are you doing? I don't even speak this language. I don't know what you're saying, but it's not right. And I mean, look, I mean, I've been doing this. I've been a stay-at-home dad for almost three years now. And my daughter uh, never hit her, never threatened her, never raised my voice at her, never called her a name. I've never, I mean, there's, there's no need for it whatsoever. And she is, you know, the happiest, smartest, uh, and very obedient, you know, because she, res we have mutual respect rather than, than threats of, of punishment. And if that's, that's the best thing that people could do. Raise their own kids or intervene in situations where you see children being harmed or threatened or aggressed against. That's the best thing. We can't save most people. I mean, they're just too, their brains have been too fucked up by propaganda, but you can do within the sphere you can control your own life your own family your own kids your own parenting your the other kids that you know around you you can do a lot and i think that's the very best thing that uh, that we can do to bring about a free society We respect our children on their own paths in life and what they want to know. Our lives are focused on trust, freedom, and the belief that humans learn best when they're internally motivated. When children are driven by their own desires, they learn what they need to in life, and it won't be according to someone else's idea of what's best for them. Learning is pleasurable for all of us when it isn't forced upon us. We're not all meant to learn the same things in life. Kids in school are all being forced to learn the same thing. Our children have as much knowledge as any child in school, but it's perfectly catered to who they are as individuals. Their knowledge far exceeds a child in school who has a cookie cutter experience. Our kids own their knowledge and what's in their minds. It's their business, not ours. They have freedom of mind, which is something that children in school today do not have. My children have learned to read simply by being surrounded by the written word. It's a total immersion learning experience. They ask us how to spell something and we communicate that with them. 
We don't tell them to go look it up. We help them and become a resource for them. Our children's interests and passions are something we really respect as an extension of who they are. I don't judge one interest as having more value in their lives over another. I see learning in all that my children do. School subjects are what most of us were really brainwashed to believe were most important to focus on, but I believe the most important subject in my child's life is whatever they happen to be interested in at the moment. We live life holistically, flowing from passion to passion, and in doing so, our children get an education perfectly catered to who they are as individuals without ever having to force them to do anything they don't want to do. They're never graded, measured, or compared to anybody else. They never take tests, yet their learning is explosive and expansive and joyful. Parents today are doing the best they can with what they know, yet many are feeling empty and wondering why their kids don't like them or want to be around them. We hear words like rebellion and chalk it up to normalcy, but what if there was nothing to rebel against? What if we lived the respect for our children that we demand that they have for us? What if we could recognize that punishments model meanness, and that through using power to control another person, we're teaching them to do the same? It's through loving kindness and understanding that our children learn love and peace, and in turn will reflect that back to the world. In our family, in other unschooling families, we don't deal with rebellion from our children because we're never the wall standing between them and their desires. In fact, we see our role as helping our children get what they want in life. We move from power struggles and control to connection and partnership. When you make that shift, you discover the love and deep feelings of joy that we're naturally meant to have as parents. Mainstream parenting is based in fear of the future living rather than being truly present in the now. There's a very big distinction between the viewpoints in contrasting ways. The way our government institutions and media are telling us to parent is perpetuating the authoritarian paradigm, which is distancing us from our children and robbing us of the joy that we're all meant to have by nature as parents. Take back your lives and the lives of your children. Take the freedom and joy that's waiting for you and begin to de-school yourself on everything you thought you knew about parenting and education. Freedom is waiting for you in ways that you've never dreamed before. Join the revolution. Just lift the veil, but rip it to shreds, burn it, so that it cannot be used again to obscure the truth. Every living thing, including you, is divine. You are your own authority. You don't have to accept the authority of others just because they say so. Matter doesn't matter. Possession of things, of people, is ridiculous and transitory. You can't take it with you when you die. You have a right to happiness, but it mustn't be at the expense of another's happiness. The veil hides the light of your divinity. Tear it. 
rip it to shreds. We are acquisitive by nature. We're pugnacious, we, we tend to argue, we debate, but we're also spiritual and religious, and these are two different things, and they're confused all the time. Spirituality is a, a tendency to know that we come from somewhere that is not here, that our energy, our will, our thoughts are not born in us. We didn't originate them, we don't invent them, we don't create them, we carry them, they pass through us. We release them, we host them in a way, we, we have to honor them, and serve them. Something that's not understood very well in the West is the idea of service to the powers that make you. We're very uncomfortable with that notion, but I think that's what's actually true. We mix that with an idea that we call religion, which are stories, invented stories, whether they have some historical background or they have no historical background. Stories that are invented to align with an idea that there was an event that was more magical than any other event, and that event we have to mark, and then we have to do various rituals to honor that, and if we don't, we're out of the group, and if we do, we're in the group, but really that comes down to power politics. So religion is the confusion of storytelling and spirituality, because we are a storytelling species. We should never forget that. Almost everything we believe is actually a story. Almost everything that we think is true is actually a kind of a myth. It doesn't matter if you're talking about government or standard religion or what you're taught in school. It doesn't matter. It's all a kind of a myth. And if you dug a little bit beneath the surface, you find webs of detail that easily refute the version that you were told, the candy-colored, plastic-wrapped version, and lead you down corridors of, well, of great interest if you're a curious person. Now, when looking at the world today, there is little doubt that what is required to change it is an evolution of spirit, a change in the general outlook of humankind. Well, I suppose I should say the inlook as well as the outlook, because that's really what a change of spirit is, isn't it? It's looking within and changing your perspective about how the world should operate and changing your perspective of what your relationship with the world is, what your relationship to reality is and how you look at the world. Most people, whether they know it or not, actually have a very narrow perspective because they're only really taking into account that which affects them personally. But if you really step back and you look at the world holistically, you begin to see that one of the big problems that we face is in fact the narrow view that most people have and that most people adhere to. And this is not to say anything against such people, this is simply the way people have been trained to operate because they're always kept in a state of scarcity and so they tend to only pay attention to that which affects them personally rather than taking a wider view of things simply because they never really have the time to do so. They're always kept on the treadmill, they're always kept running after paper and looking after their family and making sure that everything's okay in their personal life and so they just don't have time to look around them and to really look at the bigger picture. And many people want change but they're unaware how to really bring about that change because very often they fail to see that that change must come from within. It must start with a change of spirit. It isn't just about changing the political system and putting in a new party or a new government because if we don't change our spirit and change the perspective of how we view things, then all we will do is end up constructing a system which has all of the traits of the old system which made the old system so dysfunctional. So essentially, if we want to bring about any real change, we have to do it from the ground up. And we have to look at things in a completely different way to the manner in which we currently view them.
But folks, being aware of all of these things is 80% of the battle. It really is. And when you are aware of all these things, you start to change the way that you live your life. And you start to lead by example in the things that you do. And this is one of the major things that wakes up the people around you. I mean, you can scream fear, paranoia all your life. But unless they can see something in your life that they are attracted to and something that they wish to emulate, then they're not really going to listen to you. So you have to demonstrate how much this knowledge has empowered you, how much you've been able to change your life because you have the information that you are attempting to bring to them. They need to see how much of a difference it's made in you and they need to see something positive from it because if you just go and scream fear at people then then they're just going to see you as a paranoid person and they're not going to want to get involved with any of the information. They're not going to want to have any deeper understanding of reality because they're not going to see it as anything beneficial to themselves. Unfortunately, people are taught to think that way. See, they've been so brutalised and so disconnected by this society that they're only looking for things which will alleviate the subliminal pain that they all feel. They're only looking at things that will affect their own lives in a positive way. Anything else, no, don't want to know about it. Too busy trying to figure my own life out. Thank you very much. And that's the way people act because that's the way people are trained to act because that's the way people have been trained to be and taught to be. I mean, human consciousness has been shattered and brutalised and fractured and told up is down and black is white and left is right and good is bad for so long that most people really don't know what's going on at all. And so you really can't be too hard on people. You can't really be too hard on society for being in the state that it's in because people can only ever fix a problem if they know that a problem exists and if they're trained to always laugh at a problem and they're programmed not to see it well you can't blame them if their reaction is a little negative and that's why very often it's no good trying to even tell the problems to people the best thing you can do is to lead by example in all that you do and the only way you can really do that is if you have an understanding of what's going on To understand consciousness, you have to understand that all revolutions begin ultimately as revolutions of consciousness. When one group, one set, one population suddenly wakes up to their surroundings, wakes up to their present situation, and finds that they have a number of grievances with that situation. You don't have to fix this. Like, it's not for one person or one group to fix. It's too big, it's huge. You just gotta play your part. And you gotta play the part you were meant to, to play and you gotta do your best at it. And what that means first and foremost is us being conscious. And one of the things we need to do is get over this massive and sometimes intractable wall of denial that this culture has built around it and the realities of the forces that are arrayed against them. This is not to instill fear in anyone. Fear can be transmuted easily into very powerful transformative energy, but you gotta face it first. You gotta see it, you gotta acknowledge it, and you gotta recognize it. You gotta shine the light deep into the darkest parts of your shadow, and you've gotta turn that sucker inside out. It is only your own personal shadow that's gonna tear you down and tear down those around you. 
And we need to be conscious of these things and of the evils of the world and acknowledge them. Acknowledge that it is not perfect if most of the world is living on less than a dollar a day, drinking water that is riddled with disease. That's not perfect. I'm sorry, but there is simply no defense of the statement. You know, but it is not something that cannot be changed. And it's going to take particularly those of us who are awake who are conscious right now, who know what's going on. Now, what is the greater crime? To be asleep and to not be aware of something and therefore proceed forward in an action or to be conscious of something, to know that something needs to change and to still choose to turn away from it. You know, I mean, birth is painful. Birthing anything is painful and it's bloody. But eventually it all gets cleaned up and there's this beautiful little life form. And then it's our responsibility to nurture that form. This next step that we are in, this evolutionary leap that we are slamming into, it's real and it's happening. And it's up to each and every one of us to do something. So don't be afraid because there is afraid, if not more of us, we are of them. So with that in mind and with that as a context, I'm going to read you a quote from this really amazing writer named Kingsley Dennis, who I happen to like quite a bit. And this is from a book called New Consciousness from a New World. For long periods of human history, there has been active forces penetrating our world that seek to keep humanity asleep and distracted from themselves. Also, that these forces are aware of the true power of human consciousness and that the social power structures used to influence and manipulate the masses would collapse if true human potential were to be exercised. Therefore, in pursuit of control and power, certain forces active upon the earth aim to artificially suppress the natural evolution of human consciousness. Humanity is caught in a struggle and our consciousness is the battleground. It may come as unnerving news to some to hear that humanity is constantly being bombarded by forces and events beyond our control. This does not make us impotent, however. All natural organisms are under the influence of external forces. Yet with humanity, there are also other forces at work. These forces are deliberate, more often than not man-made, and they manipulate with intent. They aim to persuade if possible and coerce if necessary. It is these forces that seek to target the remaining spaces where humanity has a modicum of free choice and free will. To some degree, these forces are part of the requirements of civilization to shepherd and organize a burgeoning population. Yet over and above this exists exploitative forces that work against the laws of conscious evolution. It is these forces and the need to overcome them that form a core theme of our times. The perpetual battlefield is what we know as our everyday lives. Our education, our work, our leisure, our emotional and spiritual well-being, and our conscious thinking. Yet the armaments of this struggle are not guns, tanks, airplanes, bombs, or battle cruisers. It is much more subtle than this. It is less hardware and more software. It is, in effect, a very silent war. And it is a war which is even more important than the tragic physical scourges occurring on our beautiful planet. It is a war that targets not only the present, but also the long-term future of our civilization. And it has been going on for as long as humankind has existed on planet Earth. What is this war? It is a battle for our minds, how we think. In short, it is the war of consciousness.
I was a typical woman. I measured my successes in inches, dollars, accomplishments, and acquisitions. And somehow I always had the feeling that there had to be more, there had to be more to life than this. And I didn't know what it was. And I just tried to do my best. But it just always seemed like my best didn't get me where I wanted to go. And then I woke up and I realized it was the system that was the problem and not me. I realized that everything is a lie. Whatever you've been told, the opposite is true. If you were told that your success is measured in inches and dollars, accomplishments and acquisitions, the truth is that your success is measured in how you deal with whatever life deals you. That there is no real right or wrong way to succeed in life. It all just depends on how you deal with the hand that you're dealt with. And so there's no point in comparing yourself to anyone else. It's just your personal journey. It doesn't matter if you have a, a house with a picket fence and 2.3 kids and a Labrador or a high paying job or whatever else that people usually measure success by. What matters is just your own personal journey. So I woke up, but the way I woke up was the rude awakening, like it is for a lot of people. Sometimes that's what it takes. A lot of times it takes a shock for people to wake up. So before you have this shock, you hear things like, Food is genetically modified. Our strawberries shrivel because their genes have been altered. And you kind of think, so what? What does it matter? It should be okay. Some people say that vaccines are no good. And you think, well, surely the government wouldn't allow something that's so dangerous to be given to all our children. Maybe you don't even want to hear about it until one day it's your child who's damaged by a vaccine. And suddenly you realize that you're going to have to open your eyes and open your mind if you want to survive. And if you want your child and all our children to survive and to thrive. And a lot of people are waking up and it's, it's a slow process, but it's gathering momentum. And often it's a painful process, but we have to change and we have to wake up because staying asleep isn't working. It isn't working for anyone except for the people who want to control us, to dumb us down, to make us sick. But because I realized everything is a lie, I started to realize that everything is also okay. And that all, all those things that I'd been measuring myself by, they were all based on lies. And the fact was that all along, I was okay, my life was okay, my way of thinking was okay. There was never anything wrong with me, and I just had to learn to trust my instincts. And for a lot of people, waking up has been more than just realizing about the ills that are going on in the world, but a shift in consciousness and it's opened them up to be able to receive more love and to send out more love. That's how you transform things. So whatever you do, do it with love. And keep waking people up. We don't want to keep doing things the way we are doing them now. We've realized, we've come to fully accept and understand that our actions, our way of seeing our planet and the way of seeing each other is, 
has created a world that is not harmonious, it's not comfortable to live in. So when we're talking about foundations, we really need to understand that everything that we do and everything that we start to create has to be harmonious with everybody. Now I think what's important here is we also have to consciously change the way we perceive our world. I actually think this step is more important and should come before we begin physically changing all the aspects of our world. I think they go hand in hand with one another because as you begin to consciously think differently, you're also starting to realize the physical solutions that exist. You're also wanting to really push them into fruition and push them into being because you are now feeling so uncomfortable in the current world where we are not harmonious with one another that our consciousness is really driving and pushing us forward to start actually putting these solutions into place. And I think that's where we are right now. So to, to think about things differently and to see our world differently is a massive step that humanity needs to take and they are taking as things progress right now. Now the way we consciously go about changing the way we perceive the planet is by realizing that the way we've been living is not our natural state. It's not what we came here to, to be or to do. We are not creatures of war, that's not who we are. While that appears to be the case due to the fact that our system and our world has pushed that so heavily into us and that we've been believing and repeating this idea so heavily, that is not who we truly are. Not only is history showing us that, when you look past thousands and thousands of years into cultures that go long before the time of our accepted version of history. But we are also seeing in the very change that is happening amongst people today on the planet, you have people that are wanting to live in community. They want to work with each other. They want to live and work harmoniously. That number, as someone who has followed this whole progression in doing the work that I do, I've seen the change happen to more and more people. Numbers are growing and it's happening every month. More and more and more people are starting to feel this change within them that says, we can't consciously look at the world the way we have been in the past. We may feel naked and exposed, but as perceivers, we will learn that truth needs no clothing. If we accept what is, it will take the sting out of reactivity and create an insight into the way we make our lives happen. We are all wise. We each have access to inner truth. No one holds a single key to truth above all others. Rest in your emerging divinity and consciousness. Don't grasp for it. Receive it and enjoy. The idea of disengaging from the system, I mean, first let me just say that there's so many systems that we are connected to just because of the age in which we live and are functioning in. You have your education system, the political system, the media, and, and the health system, all these different things. To me, you, you cannot have a system without people 
you know it's it's not so much about the system because the system is not real and so if you really want to change the world you have to change yourself you have to change yourself and you have to become aware of who you are and the power you have and start being that which you know you are it's important that we understand this this principle that my baba gave me and that is it all begins and ends with me and if every person began to function with that understanding that you're not a victim of some system of some experience that you've had in your life but that you truly are in a position to be sovereign over your experiences when everybody begins to function at that level you can't help but see the world change And so, again, the universal message that I continue to hear is that it all begins and ends with me. If you realize that this is not working for my life, you are in a position to change it. You can grow your own food. You can educate your own children. You don't have to participate in the political system. You don't have to have a sense of dependability on systems. You don't have to run to the pastor to try to connect to God and have a conversation with spirit about your life and figure out what is the divine purpose and destiny. You are powerful. Take your power back. Take your power back. It all begins and ends with you. It all begins and ends with me. Unless you are ready to truly heal yourself and do what's necessary to to balance your mind, body, and spirit, then no matter what happens outside of you, what is going on inside of you will always override. Your most powerful position is inside. you want to see it change then concentrate on yourself and where you are positioned in relationship to others because that's where the real work begins that's how the world changes one sovereign being at a time and when I say sovereign I mean divine sovereignty because we are the gods of this earth we get to keep the earth fertile or desecrate it it's our doing that affects our environment it's our doing that creates healing or disease it's our doing that is dictating what kind of food is available anytime you want to disengage Concentrate on yourself. It all begins and ends with you. It all begins and ends with me. That is the broad message to humanity that each one of us has the opportunity to function in a very powerful and positively impactful way in this world.
To me, the idea of a voluntary society is a place where every man, woman, child, being is able to express themselves fully without the threat of force or violence against them for their choices in their own lives. To me, this is also what is known as anarchy. Anarchy coming from two Greek words and signifying no or without an arc, meaning government, hence anarchy meaning no government. And in an anarchist society, we would have what is known as voluntarism, the belief in creating a voluntary society without force, the ideas of the non-aggression principle, the ideas that we can all work together and can respect each other and have our own minds and our own ability to take care of ourselves, taking the government out of social interaction and getting rid of this paternalism that we see where the government has control of everything. And to me, it goes deeper than that as well. I mean, recognizing that we have paternal systems that have taken control and we have turned away from the feminine as well. The feminine of paying attention to our planet and to our spiritual side. And so to me, when you start to work towards a voluntary society or an anarchist society, you're really reconnecting back to a closer, more natural state to what we probably experienced in the past. And my research into voluntarism and to create a voluntary society led me towards the idea of agorism. And agorism is basically the idea of anarchy and action. And so taking the ideas of self-rule and creating these, these better systems and actually going out in the world and doing it. So agorism is what I like to think of as once people have decided to stop reading about creating a voluntary society, or an anarchist society and stop talking about it and decided to go out in the world and do this. So you look at any problem that we may face in the world or any you know any any situation we're dealing with where there is a state or government option and try to find ways that you as an individual or the community can do it better. So one of these ways is the food. Right now there's a huge monopoly on our lives and specifically on what we ingest, what we put into our bodies. Growing your own food is one of the biggest steps towards independence. It lessens the control that the monopolies have on your lives, and it also helps us localize and focus on what we can do here at home. A big part of that for me is why focusing on anarchy and focusing on the self is so important because we have we have individuals who are lost in themselves and are easily manipulated and taken advantage of by the state and they buy into the division they buy into the fear they buy into all these different aspects but when you start to really go deeper with this and not just in a political understanding of uh, anarchy or you know global events but going deeper with it and really focusing on how you can better your local area how you can better yourself and all these things you start to connect on a level that I believe takes you past just politics and understanding of that world you start to connect with yourself and when you go out there and you, you start to create gardens or you create alternative currency networks or creating barter networks or just communicating and talking to your neighbors and moving past division and getting outside of the boxes, the matrix so to speak and learning to connect with each other. I think that's what's bringing us closer to evolving as a species and I believe we are doing this already. The fact that these conversations are taking place, that these ideas are being explored shows that they are spreading. And so I see the work of volunteerism and anarchism 
and agorism as hugely important, recognizing the power of your own self and what you're capable of, and the fact that nobody else can control you or should try to control your choices. And in that political philosophy of voluntarism, the idea is that the best way society can improve and the only way society can truly improve is the individualist method, the method of everybody doing their own to improve themselves. The idea is hoping that we can each change our individual units and as we do that and that idea spreads, society will begin to improve as well. It's going to be a process. That's something that we have to accept to a degree. It may not take a hundred years. It may be less. It may be a short decade. It, nobody really knows because we're creating all of this in the moment as we continue to move forward. We have all of the means necessary. We have all of the technologies, the, the, the ways, the ideas, the creativity to create what we need to create for housing, for food, for energy for anything that we actually need it's already there we just need to consciously start with community so here is what i think is a perfect way to start begin small begin in your community start doing things that can actually bring change If you need to create groups of people that get together and start sharing ideas, start talking amongst each other, start financially supporting each other when it comes to projects that you're working on or creating community gardens or creating community greenhouses, anything that can begin bringing people together in harmony and doing things to take steps in the community. As you do this, the community begins to show the rest of the people around that something else is possible, that there are other ways of doing things, whether it be with food, whether it be with creating a, an earthship or an off-grid type house, or whether it be working on alternate energy technologies or project technologies that can really create and show your community that there are other possibilities. As you begin to show the community, the word starts to spread. That community gets larger. Things keep happening all over the world. And next thing you know, it becomes something that globally is known everywhere. That more and more possibilities and more solutions are available to us. Imagine if nobody took the time to do this within their community. How is the world going to know? How is your neighbor going to understand that there are different possibilities? Not everybody is going to, to take the time to really go and research all of this stuff. They need to see it. They want to see it in action. They want to see it happening. So for that reason, I think it's very important that we all start within our community and let it expand outwards. Start making a difference where it's possible today. It's very difficult to go ahead and just do one thing that's going to affect the entire world immediately. But if you look at it in a different way, that one thing that you do in your community will and is affecting the entire world because it's slowly spreading a message. 
It's slowly spreading an example and a vibration that's basically saying other things are possible, we can do this, and the consciousness of the planet is changing as we actually go about making these differences on the planet. The possibilities are endless for what we can create and it starts with each and every one of us beginning to consciously and physically make these changes. Start within your community and watch as this revolution spreads to the entire global community. How do we get out of this problem? Well, we don't. I mean, as Jim Morrison said, nobody here does get out alive, and we'll all go to the other place at some point. Maybe that's a relief at a certain point in life. But we're gonna be here as long as we are, and I think the best thing to do, and I can't be the only person saying this, is to get to know your neighbors. And if you don't have a place where you wanna to get to know your neighbors, move. It's that simple. If you don't like where you're living now, move go to a place with some land, a change of seasons, something that doesn't invite every single tourist in the world, don't live in a high rise, don't live in something that's macadam and brick and no turf and no soil. Listen, we're, we're not coming out of the industrial age, you know, all at once. This is a, a long, uh, what do people call it, a jagged plateau, a jagged descent, but those jags can hurt. You want to know your neighbors. You want to join with them. You don't want to pay attention to government. You want to support each other. You're going to want to make sure that you have each other's back. And I don't mean that you're running out with guns when the marshals come. I mean that you just know where each other are. And when somebody comes and tells you you can't grow food in the front yard, you do go over and you go, actually, in our neighborhood we can. And that's the way it is. And if enough people in a town go, that's the way it is. We grow food in our front yards here. We like it then that's the way it is. Because in a declining system, a government's gonna have limited ability to really fight people on every issue. And if you don't present a violent threat, they probably won't fight you. But you do have to begin to grow food. And in order to grow food, you have to know how to grow food. You have to learn to trade with people for important goods and services. You want to collect things that may be hard to get in, in, a, in an oil-strapped future, things that travel a long way. You don't want to prepare for the end of the world because nobody survives that kind of thing. You want to prepare for a transition into the 19th century, into an agricultural period. It may not, it, look, it's not going to happen tomorrow. So I'm not telling you to become Mel Gibson in the road work. I'm not advocating that. I'm not telling you to become Laura Ingalls Wilder. I'm telling you to learn how to be a human being again. That's what I have to do. I'm no different than you. I have to learn exactly these skills again. I have to learn how to pick up an ax, and I've done it, but cut down a tree to use the wood, to shape the wood into blocks so that I can build things out of, so that I can build raised beds, so that I can fix a piece of a declining wall or a roof that has a hole in it. We have to learn old things again. And if oil and coal and tar sands and the rest of the nonsense that we're up to now holds us out for 40 more years, you'll be happy that you're not living in a city that's filled with coal, ash, and dust, and mercury and arsenic. Holding on to that last bit of the high life. You'll be happy that your life is a little quieter, a little more removed from the insanity that the Western world has absolutely become. You'll be happier because you learn to take care of yourself and your friends 
and your neighbors. If you follow what I'm saying, I'm saying keep your friends close and make friends. In all mysteries, when you're going to be initiated, there's somebody saying, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, don't you come in. You've got to fulfill this requirement, this requirement, this requirement, this requirement, then we'll let you in. And so you go, you, you go through the mill. Why? Because this is, you are saying to yourself, I won't wake up until I feel I deserve it. I won't wake up until I've made it difficult for me to wake up. So I, th I, I invent for myself an elaborate system of delaying my waking up. I put myself through this test and that test and when I feel it's been sufficiently arduous, then I may at last admit to myself who I really am and draw aside the veil. subsequent actions we take that create and determine what the picture is. It's an infinite fractal kaleidoscope of consciousness. We've been given this precious gift of life, yet waste most of our time doing things we don't really want to do, just to make money to be able to exist. Developing consciousness is everything because we create the picture and as we look to ourselves for answers and expand our potential, we become more conscious. By infiltrating the system with this consciousness, by creatively engaging with it, that's how the world around us will change from inside out. From inside out. said and done. I am that I am.
One of the really exciting things about this story is the fact that there's hope for everyone within every single person it exists that same divine spark, that same potential to see, to really see, to have sight beyond sight, to understand that everything they are looking at has some sort of clue, some sort of message, some sort of lesson of how the rest of it all fits together so neatly. So now, right now, more than ever, more than yesterday, the time is upon us to use the tools that we have within arm's reach to really decide what is the story that we are here to tell. What is the story that we are here to live? Each one of us has the potential to be our own hero. To find our own freedom. So we have to create our mythos. We have to use our ability and our voice to share our story. Developing consciousness is everything because we create the picture. The path to freedom in your life starts with a freedom mindset. To think about things differently and to see our world differently is a massive step that humanity needs to take. You are powerful. We come to teach and to be taught, to be one with everything, ready for anything. Merging shadow and light, feminine and masculine. We are finding our balance. We're bringing it all together as it all falls apart. We're on assignment here. We have a purpose. We have a reason for being here. You know it. It's why you're here. To love yourself enough to grow and expand into the beauty we were all meant to be. This is the time. This is the place. And we are not fighting anything anymore. We are embracing and loving, forging our bonds within so they can be without in this grand spiral of life as we merge all levels of self into one and give our whole a chance at something much greater than we have ever allowed ourselves. This is our future, casting off all the shackles, tearing down the veils that left us blinded to the truth so simple and profound that we breathe a breath much deeper than we ever have allowed ourselves to take. This is the love that we have for ourselves and for each other. This is the reality we seek, free from our own oppression for it is truly ourselves that have allowed this madness to continue in such a way. Rise, brothers and sisters, for this is our time. <laughs>